During my 37 years of teaching, and this is more to the student athletes, I had the opportunity to coach and work with student athletes that made me very successful in my tenure. Winning national titles or Eastern titles, state or sectional or county titles were great, but it was the privilege of working alongside exemplary co colleagues, dedicated parents, and most of all, capable and motivated athletes that I cherish the most. I hope I was a role model for them and impacted them in a positive way. This year, we are dedicating, we are dedicating our induct, induction and, and this banquet uh, to the honor of Coach Arch Jess, Arch Jessup, who was one of our founding men, members Tremendous mentor, coach from Washingtonville for, well, since maybe 1965. Um, he passed late this summer, and um, we want to dedicate tonight to the memory of our Jessup. If you have any such memories in your head, um, bring them up. This is a great time to do it because um, many of us are here because of our Jessup. And, and I have to include myself. Okay. So Good afternoon, everyone. First thing I'd like to do is uh, 
tell you my Art Jessup story. Uh, other people are going to do that, I'm sure. 1995, my first uh, season as a track official, West Point. They're doing the 4 by 8 with 27 teams. And I'm standing at the finish line, and I look down and I see this one guy. He's putting all the legs of the 4x8, uh, each, uh, each of the legs on the track, himself. And he knew exactly whose turn it was to go on. And I asked, who was that guy? And who do you think it was? Art Jessup. That's my Art Jessup story. A lot of years uh, working with him as a, an official when he was a coach and as a, uh, an official when he was an official. Uh, and also uh, seeing him on the golf course periodically. And, and on the Hall of Fame committee. He, and he was responsible for this program. And I can't tell you what a, uh, what, what a project it was trying to do all the things that Art did in putting this program together. Uh, we, didn't, we now realize how valuable he was. Jerry Berry. Everybody remembers their firsts. For example, today uh, Jim Glover and I were at a fundraiser for Fearless and uh, Catherine Switzer was there. Catherine Switzer works, lives in uh, New Paltz in New Zealand and she was the first woman who ran the uh, Boston Marathon and she registered as Kay Switzer. She was there. My, I remember my first uh, time that I, my father threw me the keys to the car and I went out solo driving when I was dropped off at college for the first night. Jerry was my first mentor as a starter. Jerry, Barry. Menacing, modified. He let me shadow him. He let me start a couple of inconsequential races. He was my mentor. He also uh, was a, was a uh, starter for the Orange Classic for many years. I don't know if you realize that. And after he moved out to Phoenix, uh, Frank Giannino gave me the honor of uh, filling him as a starter at the Orange Classic. I'm uh, really impressed with, uh, with how Jerry was calm. And he was a social worker. I'm a social worker. I was a social worker for Monroe Luther. So he was, he was calm and he always uh, was there uh, whenever I needed some advice. So I, I appreciated uh, following in his footsteps. And uh, he's in uh, Phoenix, couldn't be here today, but thank you very much. And I hope you can remember and honor both Judy and Jerry Berry. So before I invite up Rich to help with the introduction of our next inductee, this one's a bit personal for me. First time ever that I've done our master of ceremonies, um, the inductee's been as personal as this particular individual is as well. And I haven't told them yet, but if I can have uh, Elijah and Adam please come up as well. So they can come up here and uh, be part of this. So Adam is a 2011 graduate of Middletown High School. He was part of a, um, a championship team. And then we have Elijah, who was one of our top hurdlers in 2019, correct? Now I'm not saying I was top in anything, but I was a 1984 graduate of Middletown in track and field. Uh, one of the co-captains that year. And the common thread as we were all talking on the back uh, table over there is that we were all coached by the same individual. And that individual is our next inductee. And for a variety of reasons, this gentleman has had an impact on the lives of these three men standing up here. Diverse individuals. When coach comes up here, you'll see he's not a diverse individual, but nevertheless, he spent his life, his life, coaching not only athletes,
athletes, but individuals who came from different backgrounds, um, and he had an impact on us from all that backgrounds. For me, and I'm gonna try to stretch over here so I can kind of talk to Coach a little bit more personally. I was a scrawny little Puerto Rican kid back in Middletown in the 1980s. And when I first ran out for track, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Didn't realize I was a sprinter. So the first day they had me, and I was telling these guys, they had me run out with the long distance runners. Now typically long distance runners don't get along with sprinters. That's been the, the mantra over the years. And so they had me go out, and we ran down 211, past Buffalo Wild Wings, where it is now, it used to be farmland back then probably, if I remember correctly. But after like three miles, I had to walk the rest of the way. I was obviously not. And coach saw me one time running on the back straightaway and said, you're with the wrong folks. You need to come over here. And many of us who were sprinters back then would look at coach and say, how would you know anything about sprinting? Because coach was kind of short back then. And uh, he took us on. And he would run against us. And he would beat us with his hair, whatever was remaining back then, flying back and forth. He used to beat us all the time. And that's how he earned the respect. He would take on all the sprinters every time when they were uh, back then. But coach, um, I want to thank you for the impact you've had on my life. Um, as folks know who have coached in inner cities, uh, Malcolm can attest to this in New York as well, a lot of the student athletes come with baggage. Baggage that they have to deal with at home, whether it be poverty, whether it be one single households, what have you, that baggage sometimes comes. I remember a couple years ago, you guys had what would have been a national sprinter female and she wasn't coming to practice, and one time I asked, well, why did she come into practice? It's because she had to take care of her siblings, because mom had to work in the city. So those are the things that, that coaches in places like a New or or Middletown are constantly having to deal with, in addition to helping to train great athletes. So um, I know that he's had an impact on both of these lives. You had an impact on me 40, almost 40 years ago next year. So I've known Coach for 44 years now, through his five decades of uh, coaching at Middletown. And uh, I know we all thank you on behalf of us, and we'll have Rich come up and do the official induction for head coach Kevin Hipsman. Okay, so about this time I started coaching, at about the same time, there was a coach who coached in Middletown, and his name was, was Kevin Hipsman. I just want to give you a different perspective. Um, for, for my entire coaching career, there's one coach who's always been here, always been there, and he's, and he's still out there, and that's Kevin. Uh, Hipsman stood out as a coach because, because, just because of the kind of man that he is. Um, he's always presented himself as a colleague, not as an adversary. And in our profession, sometimes coaches get scared to get the coach, get the, not, not kept. He was a real guy, a real person, and he was a, he was a real coach, not just not just of his athletes. Uh, so he was, he was a life coach. Um, uh, so <laughs> let me just I'm adjusting for my new glasses here. Uh, so. He was, always, he was very much disarming when it came to the, um, to, to the coaches, you know, or a, as we see each other on the, on the field. Um, it's very hard to compete against a guy and get your athletes riled up to compete against a team when you like the coach or the other team. Um, and he's that kind of guy. His athletes respected him and they liked him. And for that, uh, and that stands out. You just saw a little example of that. Um, whether whether coaches, whether Kevin was coaching at Middletown or at Port Jervis, his approach to his athletes was the same, and they all responded in a very positive way. He's more than a track coach, and for five decades, he's been a life coach, and that's what makes him a member of our Hall of Fame. So please come up, Kevin Hensley.
Section 9 Track and Field Hall of Fame, Middletown Hall of Fame inductees 2023, Coach Kevin Hipsman, Track Coach 1974 to 1990, 2005 to present, 75 Section 9 champions, 2011 New York State champions 4x400 and 400 meter, 2011 team number one in New York State, 2011 team number four in the USA, Coach Hall of Famers Debbie Coven and Chris Egger. This is what will go to the Middletown School District on your behalf. It's a pleasure to be here today to induct David to the Hall of Fame. Dave ran for a coach with Gene Dahl four years before coming to the helm of Cornwall. He is now in his 36th year of teaching and coaching. And fortunately for me, he was one of the reasons I was hired 34 years ago. We have been side by side at the track ever since. I can honestly say that there are some weeks we spend more time together than we do with our own families. I'm supposed to keep this very short, but with coaching with Dave and all the great moments, it's gonna be very hard, so I'm gonna talk. In just cross country, Davis coached 22 girls and 13 boys Section 9 championship teams, seven OCIA county championships, one girls New York State team champion in 2018, three different New York State individual federation champions. Current Hall of Famers Mike Fitzul and Ashley Cuff who are here today. Thank you so much for traveling up. And future Hall of Famer Karen Logan. Davis, the only coach in the United States of America with two different footlock and national champions, Ashley and Karen. In just track and field, both indoor and outdoor, Dave has amassed, and I'm sure I missed a bunch of these, a tremendous resume. He has 42 team divisional champions, championships, excuse me, 41 team section nine championships, six team county championships, 16 individual state champions, three state relay champions, and a two-time track national champion. If you were one of the people on one of those teams, well, please raise your hand now. <laughs> Brings back the blast of some great times in the past. Dave has also been named the 2021 20, uh, New York Northeast Cross Country Coach of the Year and recently the 2023 NFHS Girls Outdoor Coach of the Year. And although these numbers are great, it is not what makes Coach Ford a great coach. He is great because he is passionate about what he does every single day. Coaching is not working a job. Coaching is following a passion. I have never in all my years in this sport, and it's quite a few at this point, seen someone so passionate about this fantastic sport that we all love. Dave, much to the chagrin of many of the athletes in this room, never takes a day off in any way. Trust me, I know. We have been overheated, frozen, wet, and just baked in the sun many, many, many times. It is this passion and desire to help others prove that makes Dave great. He knows when to push an athlete, when to high five an athlete, when to pick up some of the pieces, and when to wipe away some of the tears. A good coach knows how to get athletes to hit splits. A great coach knows how to get you to do way more than that. For those reasons, and many more, he is a great coach. And that is why so many people are here to show their support for him today. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you my great friend and Hall of Famer, Coach David Fuller. I think Brian covered it all. Do I have to actually give a speech? <laughs> okay. Uh, I was here sitting where all of you are last year and the year before because I had athletes getting inducted and I was reading the program and looking at the coaches who had been inducted up to last year. And the last thing I thought uh, was gonna happen was that I was gonna be here this year getting inducted as a coach. So uh, I really want to thank the Hall of Fame Committee for hosting this event. All right, this, this looks easy when you just show up and, and enjoy it, but I know all the hours that the Hall of Fame Committee put in to pull this off. Uh, they meet once a week for months and months, uh, and, and it's a great thing that they do for our, our sport. Uh, I've never felt awards 
like this were possible to achieve without a lot of help along the way. Uh, so for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about we, not about me. Okay, Brian, Brian took care of all the numbers and great kids that we've had that have accomplished great things. And who is this we I'm referring to? Uh, first of all, friends and family. My two kids are here. They literally just landed, one from Florida, one from North Carolina this morning, Jess and Matthew. You miss a lot of time with your kids when you coach three seasons, but they always understood. And we had, we had great, up, they had great upbringings anyway. They turned out to both be teachers. So I'm very proud of that. So uh, I'm so glad that they could be here uh, today. Uh, they talk about how hard coaching is. Well, the really hard job is being married to a coach. Uh, it's, yeah, we're, we're kind of out there. So, and we're, not, and we're not around too much. And sometimes I think that they like that. <laughs> After a while, when you say, uh, I'm gonna be away 12 hours Saturday, and when they start saying, okay. <laughs> You kind of wonder if it's actually good for the relationship, but uh, my wife Lori, I, I can't thank her enough for putting up with everything that Brian said uh, we do uh, on a regular basis. I have to mention, uh, we were talking about impact before, my, my high school coach sat down next to me, I was on the edge of a swimming pool uh, about a week before senior year. We, we did an eight mile run and then coach would let us in the pool to cool off. And I'm sitting at the edge of the pool after I jumped in, I'm just relaxing, it was a hot day. And he sat down next to me. My coach was Gene Dahl, legendary high school coach who's in multiple Hall of Fames. And uh, he said, so what are we doing next year? And I said to myself, I don't, coach, I don't even know what I'm doing tomorrow. He said, no, what are we doing next year? I'm going to college. I said, I think so. He says, no, you're going to college. He says, what do you want to be? I'm like, I, I don't know yet. He's like, well, you like sports, right? I said, yeah, I love sports. He says, why don't you do what I do? I think you'd be good at it. So I said, I said to myself, well, what you just did, you sat in an air-conditioned van, <laughs> and you had a cup of coffee, a buttered hard roll, and the Daily News, and you watched us run eight miles. So I said, I could do that. And guess what I did two days ago? I sat in my car, and I watched kids run seven miles with Brian. Pretty good gig, pretty good gig. Uh, so I have to thank Coach, I have to thank, uh, my high school teammates were great. My Cortland years were great. I had many great people at Cortland, great professors that, that pushed me. Uh, I have to mention a professor I had at Cortland multiple times because I just read of her passing. If any of you went there, Dr. McGinley, Dr. Phyllis McGinley. Uh, I'll say it quick. I was taking a class with her, and one day we had to go to an elementary school and, and start to observe classes. So my ride bailed on me, and I went to her an hour before. I had to be in Homer, which is the booming metropolis next to Cortland. Uh, so I said, Dr. McGillian, I don't have a ride. The kid, kid went home. She's, uh, I'm like, I'll make it up. I'm, I just want to let you know so you can call the teacher out in Homer. She says, well, that's not a problem. Just take my car. I was like, I, I really, it's not. I'll just make it up. She says, no, 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 this is important. Take my keys. It's the white Mustang out in the parking, the faculty parking lot. So I got this brand new Mustang. I'm like, oh man, don't mess it up. I, I get, I open the door, I get in the seat. I look down, it's a stick shift. I don't know how to drive a stick shift. So I go back, I say, Dr. McGinley, thanks, but I can't drive your car. It's manual transit. I, I only know how to drive home. Man. She says, all right, well, let's go. I said, what do you mean? She says, I'm gonna teach you. I said, I gotta beat her in 25 minutes. This is plenty of time. So, she probably needed a new clutch after that, but just, she would not let me miss that first day of observation. So, those are the kind of people that have uh, impacted 
uh, my life in a great way. All my administrators, uh, I started at North Rockland, four years. Ralph Cordisco gave me my first coaching job. Joe Casarella gave me my first teaching job. Since then, I just gotta mention their names because they never, they never say no to me. And uh, it's kind of hard because I'm a pain and I don't take no for an answer. But they always give me the resources and the money to run a first class operation. So I have to thank uh, Tom McDonald, gave me my start in Cornwall 36 years ago, Greg Ransom, Mike Bellarosa, Luciafi, Mike Cromer, and my current athletic director is here, Mr. Jason Simo. Now, I've had great assistant coaches. So, so the guy who just spoke greatly about me about a couple minutes ago, he really should be here beside me. And everybody knows that. Uh, my first two years, my assistants were a landscaper and a throughway toll taker. And they were not very reliable or knowledgeable. Nice people, but throughway toll taker sent 25 distance runners up over Storm King Mountain when it was open and almost had them all killed. And the landscaper said, I'll see you after Easter break and never came back. So when my AD said, I have a young guy, ran for Washingtonville, I said, hire him. I said, no, no, I, we got to, I said, just hire him. He ran for the great Art Jessup. That's all I have to know. So he's been with me 34. Uh, of the 36 years, I have uh, Jeff Moulton's been with me for 23 years. I've had great assistants, Brian Evans, Mike St. Lawrence runs our middle school program and sends us great kids uh, every year. So to all my assistants, this is your accomplishment too. And finally, uh, to the athletes. I want to thank you for allowing me to coach you. I want to thank you for trusting me with your talent and your dreams and never settling for mediocrity. Okay, it's one of my phrases is do not settle. And Cornwall kids, Cornwall parents have been great to me. Uh, I was also thinking of all the great places that these kids have taken me by qualifying for meets. I've been to California nine times for athletes. San Diego seven times. San Francisco, Sacramento, um, Washington. Oregon, North Carolina, Philadelphia about 36 times, <laughs> Iowa, Boston, Spain, Trinidad, thank you Ashton Cuff, Indiana, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Virginia, and Rhode Island. So, uh, and, and I have to say, this isn't on my speech, I am blown away by how far people, I'm sure a lot of people traveled far to see all the indu inductees. Uh, I have kids who travel to see me today from Bermuda, Virginia, North Carolina, Buffalo, Delaware. It just blows me away. Uh, I'm so, so good to see them. Uh, I'm gonna close with a quote from the great uh, Pat Summit. Pat Summit was a Tennessee basketball coach. When she retired, she had more wins than any man or woman in Division I. Uh, it's a short quote, but I think it really sums up how to treat athletes and treat, treat students and I guess just treat people. Pat Summers' quote was, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So once again, I'm honored and extremely thankful to every single one of you. Uh, and if you had anything to do with this award, I can't thank you enough. The last 50 years of coaching has never been about winning from me. Even though my family they disagree as uh, they accuse me of uh, cheating and monopoly every time we play. Coaching and, and teaching it for me has always been about service to our young generations as well as a love of sport for track and field. Don't get me wrong, I do, I do enjoy um, success of the teams and the athletes I, that have achieved over the years. Watching these uh, young men and women grow up, be productive members of our community is the most um, rewarding part of coaching. It puts a smile on my face every time my wife and I go out to eat and one of my athletes come up and you know, wants to say hi or gives me a, tells me a, some story about when he was on or she was on the track team. 
Now you've met two of my athletes who I really uh, admire. They, they really showed me that they worked through adversities. They've uh, had a lot of things going on in their life. And they came to practice, they worked hard, they make me look good. Alright? Also, I'd like to uh, also recognize Eddie Estrada was one of my first athletes I ever had. And I can remember uh, we had just gotten a new track in Middletown uh, before this one, the last one. And uh, we, we were having a Middletown invitation on the relays at that time. And we just got the, the record came in, the time here the record came in. And I didn't realize that, that Eddie was uh, uh, selected as being the county Orange County athlete, a scholar athlete for that year. We were, my wife and I were so proud of him. Um, that was more important than any uh, um, winning that I could have done. I was very proud of him at that time. Just as I am proud of the uh, two young men sitting out um, in the audience today, they are um, real examples of what Middletown track uh, can accomplish. Um, the relate, I've met a lot of people throughout the years of coaching, and one of the uh, really uh, made a connection with one young, one um, uh, family that really helped us throughout the years um, with our track program, and that's uh, Linda Knapp and her family, and I really appreciate for being here today um, to honor, to help honor this day. And without saying, I'd like to uh, thank all the committee members um, who selected uh, on the selection committee for uh, this honor. But I also would like to, I have uh, we have seven coaches in Middletown, and uh, without those coaches, the Middletown program would not be what it is today. And I really like to thank George, Paul, Judy, uh, and Rich. You make our program what it is. You, we have the honor, we have the ability to have a coach for uh, jumping, for throwing. Or, uh, the pole vault, and you guys are professionals. You do a great job, and I really appreciate um, everything you do. And especially the last the couple of years, that when I had some, so I have some medical problems, and I had to take some time off. You guys stepped up, took care of things, and we never skipped a beat. I really appreciate that. Next, I've got to. really thank my family. Uh, my daughter is, uh, they, is here, uh, her children, her, her daughter is a uh, coach track, coached uh, volleyball and uh, softball in Middletown for many years and she is now the athletic director in Eldred. I'm very proud of that. Um, my granddaughter and uh, grandson uh, have Continued with our athletic uh, athletics, which um, they are doing very well that way and also academically. I really get really get uh, excited about that. Um, also, I'm really uh, kind of uh, blessed because not only can I uh, I. Uh, coached my own kids, both Amanda and Eric were on the track team in Port Jervis and I coached. I was able to coach them. <clears throat> Alongside now, I'm coaching with Eric. Eric is, uh, uh, is uh, one of the Middletown track coaches and uh, we have worked together for now 14 years. 
and uh, that really is uh, a great honor. And then the, the last, um, my wife for 51 years, um, she has been there all, for everything. She's traveled with me when I we take people to the state meeting, and she's gone to overnight trips with me. She's uh, fills out, she's done the index card. Whatever I ask her to do, she, if you know anything, her and Linda Knapp pretty much run the concession stand for the state meet, for the, our sections, our county meets. Um, just, uh, I can't, I could not have done this without my wife. Section 9 champ, Section 9 record, 143.9, third in the state, fourth in 2002. Of Sarah's many accomplishments, she's also a graduate of the University of Rhode Island, top 10 junior USA, USATF champ in the discus as a freshman, top three in the disc, hammer, and top score for the Rams as an A-10 athlete. Sarah earned her BS in kinesiology. She's now out there coaching and helping out there. She, Sarah is also now, not only did she compete in 2016, Sarah is still training to compete in 2024 at the Olympic trials. That itself is an accomplishment for her. So she's now living in Bean Town. She's up in Boston. And I already told her if she ever wants to come back, she's got a job in Goshen. Please help me in welcoming Miss Sarah Bolton. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm first, yay. <laughs> um, what an amazing honor this is to be inducted into this amazing group of people that most of us have, you know, been a part of this world for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And to see something like this happen now is so amazing and so lovely. Um, and I know when I first started track and field as a ninth grader at Socrates High School, I had no idea that this is where my career would go. Um, I was unfortunately cut from the softball team and I went to that coach and I said, you know what, I'm gonna go join a sport that no one cuts. And I never looked back. I have had an amazing career. I've had an amazing support system. Um, my high school coaches are here. Coach Ted Sutmeyer and Coach John Lombardo. And, you know, they brought me all around, all around New York to compete, but it took me further. Um, my parents, uh, my mom is here, my dad, who was my number one, number one person for track. Um, we lost him a few years ago, but Coach Dad, you know, he was there for me every step of the way. He was at every track meet. He took me to every high school national championship. He, if he could have been to the trials, he would have found a way onto the field. <laughs> Hayward was a little bit looser uh, security then. So, you know, it was a little easier to do that. But um, I'm truly honored to be recognized in this inductee class. And thank you so much. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to everyone here. Thank you to all the families and parents and friends that are here to support your loved ones. Such an amazing night, such an amazing day, and I hope everyone has a great time. But thank you, thank you, thank you. So Sarah is Reed's uh, Friends of Section 9 Track and Field Hall of Fame, Sororities Hall of Fame inductees, 2023, Sarah Thornton, 2004 New York State Champion in the discus, 139 feet 3 inches, 2003 second New York State discus, 123 feet 2 inches, 2002 fourth in New York State discus, 124 feet 7 inches, and 2004 tenth New York State shot put, 36 feet 4, four and a quarter inch. Congratulations, Sarah. The Carol and I were teammates, thank goodness. 
She was the good one on a team, right, Coach First? Always. Oh. <laughs> you can read in her bio. She was a 1983 uh, New York State champion, cross country. She is one of the toughest, grittiest runners. <coughs> Nothing you put in front of her stops her. Coach First loves this story, and I'll tell it. We were at practice, and of course, back in the day, in those early 80s, we had our cinder track. We didn't have this nice track that you all get to run on nowadays. So Carol realized she forgot her shoes. So what does she do? We're running 200 that day. Ah, I'll run it barefoot. Okay. Now Carol did not have like a, a Jackie Casal gazelle-like stride. <laughs> Carol was a low knee, grind through the ground, and power. She was very, very powerful. So after, I don't know, 10, 12 of these, besides the feet being filthy, they started to bleed a little. Carol's like, no, no, I'm good, I'm good. I can finish them. And she did, of course. And that's part of the reason I'm not sure exactly, but that is part of the reason she is one of those respected athletes. Okay? She went on to run at George Mason. Our paths got the cross as we were in college as well, and it was great to see each other, cheer each other on. And as you know, when you get out there in the big, big world, there's a lot of competition, and it's good to see a friendly face. So it was always wonderful when we got a chance to cross paths. But as I started to say before, Carol was always the good one. She was in bed at 8.30. Always had her nails done. Her hair was quaffed and always perfect. But when it came down to the workout, she was the first one to the line and the last one to leave the track. So it is my honor to induct Miss Carol Perrietti all the way in Georgia. Um, I too have been coaching a long time and it always amazes me at these banquets how many different connections that I have and other people have with each other. So I'm going to quickly, very quickly, run through some that are funny. Judy Berry was a substitute teacher at Warwick Valley High School. And my children went to Warwick Valley High School. I mean, you know, most high school kids would just rather be absorbed into the background and not have any attention drawn to themselves. But every time Judy was a sub in a class, there was a glover in there. The, I know your father! Do you run track? Every single time. They loved her and they didn't appreciate the extra attention. Um, I also had the privilege of coaching Jacob, their son, when I was at Valley Central. Kevin Hipspin. Tremendous coach about at, uh, at Middletown High School. 2011, we had one, the most epic dual meet that I've ever been involved with. And after the meet was over, I sat down at my table and said, what you've just been involved with is rarely, if ever, happens. Uh, it came down, it was, a, it was a one or two point meet. You had to break 50 seconds to get second place in the 400. You had to break two minutes to score in the half mile. Almost sub 320 in the four by four. And it came down nose to nose. It was just a, such a competitive meet. And, and that Middletown team that year was just so loaded with, with great athletes, ones here today. And uh, it was just a privilege to coach against Kevin. He was always very gracious, but very competitive. His teams were always well prepared and, and ready to fight. Uh, Dave Foyer, known forever, a um, little point of fact, that we interviewed for the same job at Cornwall with Tom McDonald. Obviously he got it, I did not. Which, which worked out well for me and, and Dave. Um, Sarah Thornton, uh, her coach also coached Joe Pesch, who we coached with at Monroe Woodbury, Carol Parietti. We both have daughters who live in Georgia. Um, Martin Hayher, he was also around in 2011, and I remember watching him run, and watching him run later on in life. 
Chuck Forey's, I do the Section 9 and OCL record book for Cross Country, so every year I see your name out there, and I had the privilege of, of watching your sons run. And Reggie Harris, um, when I was coaching, one thing I, I want to say about Reggie Harris is that everybody loved him from the other schools and other teams. He was like legendary status with how fast he was and his talent. And he was always so gracious. Kids would, from other teams would always just go and talk to him and try to hang out with him. And, and he never minded, he, he, he was very gracious in that way. Uh, and it worked. Valley uh, Distance Medley Relay Team. I lived down the street from one of them. Uh, my daughter was friends with a bunch of them. We graduated the same year. And uh, lots of there. So on to my inductee. It's, it is my privilege to be able to induct the 11th inductee for the Monroe Bury School District. She was the 2001 OCL 100, 100 meter hurdles champion, section 9 champion, state champion, and national champion in the 100 meter hurdles. Uh, my first lap, Laura, in elementary school. Or if you'll see in her bio, she mentions how her coaches was. Coach Hall recognized how fast she was. And yes, we did. Um, I was the high school coach while she ran in middle school, and the middle school coaches talked about her a lot, and I would talk about her a lot, and how much I wanted her nurtured and developed and, and make sure she feels comfortable. And I had the privilege of coaching her as a freshman in the high school team in hurdles where I took her to the Eastern States Championship as a freshman, which normally doesn't happen. But aside from that, uh, we reconnected in the past couple of years, um, seeing her coach the youth track team on on the track for our local track club. She introduced me to her children, um, and I was most impressed with not her athletic ability, but her kindness, her thoughtfulness, her get things doneness. Um, she organized a. Uh, a tribute party for a friend of hers that passed away suddenly and organized it through Facebook and, and went through hoops to get it done and was she's just a great person and it's, it's my pleasure to, to uh, introduce Laura Paul from Monroe Woodbury. It's such an honor to be recognized for 20 years, you know, 20 years ago or 22 years ago now. Track and field obviously means a lot to a lot of people in here. Um, as a young person growing up at Monroe Woodbury, I was this height at 12 years old. <laughs> so you, you can imagine um, 98 pounds, 5'11", tall black girl in a predominantly white area was extremely hard. Um, so in third and or fourth grade, I had Glover, but Coach Hall would come to do the mile with the kids, and I, I did a terrible job in the mile, but the last 200 meters, I was like, okay, this is almost done. I can try to show up a little bit. So I ran so fast, my, my shoe fell off, but I was going so fast, Coach Hall was like, wow, we're gonna get you at a track meet. So he took me to my first track meet in third or fourth grade, and I was wearing my sister's shoes that were way too big for me because they all play basketball um, and big windbreaker pants. And I blew all the kids out the door. I was like, wow, I'm, I'm good at this. <laughs> I think I'm good at this. Um, and after that, that's, that's where my passion for track came from. Um, I, I'm, I'm one out of 11 kids. Most of them all got scholarships for basketball. Basketball was way too much of a physical contact sport for me. I said, I'll just stay in my lane and just nobody touches me in this. And, you know, if you're the fastest, you're the fastest. Track is like, it makes the most sense out of all the sports. You could jump the furthest, you could run the fastest. It's pretty elementary. So it, it definitely, um, I, I definitely felt like, I do feel like I was purposed to do that, that's my purpose. 
Um, as you can see in the bio, I, I had some, some tribulations in college, where after I had won nationals and, and had all the records where they still stand, thanks Coach Glover for uh, telling everybody. <laughs> after high school, when I went to college, it was, it, it was traumatic, coming from the environment that I just explained to you to a in the middle of Kansas with a lot of people who are Olympian gold medalists now, but um, from all different parts of the country, it was very hard. Um, and after after that experience, um, I was lost because I would see all my friends on the Olympics. I, I was waitressing, and I look at the Olympics, and I see a girl who. One gold, but never could beat me in a race. And, and we would run against each other for years, and she never could beat me. And she won gold, I just felt like, oh, you know, it could have been, should have been. But um, and after that, it took me some time to find a love again, because that was what I loved, that was my passion. And my, I gave birth to my daughter, and I said, okay, this is a good substitute of <laughs> what love is. And um, my, my three daughters, Mackenzie, Michaela, and Amaya, who's been amazing, beautiful, bright young girls who just bring so much light and life and love to my life. Um, one of our neighbors saw Mackenzie running home from school, and he said, Laura, your daughter runs home every single day, and she beats everybody. I was like, yeah, she's fast. He's like, put her in a track club. I was like, there's a track club in Monroe Woodbury? Yes. Call um, Frank's Printer Plus and um, call him. I said, okay. I called him. He asked me to volunteer as a coach. And it's, I found the love again, guys. Like, I, I, I because I did all these great things in high school, and I, I kind of looked down on people who had, you know, their glory years, like, oh, back when I was your, you know, like the, you know, look back type of person, and, you know, not fulfilling goals that you have, especially when you're a certain kind of athlete, really could do some mental work in your brain. So, to inspire and encourage kids now, and coaching is just a whole new life for me to where it's like, wow, I see exactly what I'm purposed to do. I'm so grateful and so thankful that God, my, my story wasn't over there. And, and God is continuing to use the fabric of who I am, which is the love of track, to inspire others. When someone inspires you, they help you to do the things that you want to do to fulfill your goals. And I just, I just know that coaching track now, after athlete turned coach, Coach Laura is exactly what and who God has purposed me to be. So I just thank everybody who's helped me out along the way. All my track coaches are here, Coach Hall, Coach Glover, Coach Pisakis, Coach Goodwin. I really appreciate you guys. Um, <laughs> I appreciate you guys so much, and thank you for being, you know, a friend to, you know, someone that was, I know I was a little awkward, I'm still awkward, it's okay, but it's, I appreciate the love that when, when I'm running, Coach Hall says, that's my daughter, run daughter, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's refreshing that you guys are all here now, and all my family is here, Jalen, thank you for coming, and thank you guys for this recognition, um, Thank you. So like Section 9 Track and Field Hall of Fame, Monroe Woodbury Hall of Fame inductees in 2023, Laura Paul, 2001 New York State champion in the 100 meter high hurdles, 14.02. 2001 National Champion, 100 meter high hurdles, 14.21. Section 9 record, 100 high hurdles, 14.02. Well, this is headed to Central. Woo! Hello, everybody. I'm back. 
Um, I'm honored to speak to you about Martin Hare today. Although I never coached Martin, I saw him run some amazing races throughout his high school career. One I will never forget was against Tim Luthen of Warwick, the senior year at Bear Mountain. The two, two young men were running together for most of the race at the two mile mark. Uh, they were practically side by side. And as I tell my runners, it's what you do in the last mile that makes you a great runner. And in that last mile, Martin pulled away and showed how great he was and wound up putting the race by, I believe, about 20 seconds. Is that correct, Martin? Sure. I think so. Yes. Martin went on to win the Orange County Championship. At the end of that season, he went on to run a Nike Cross Nationals in Oregon, where he placed 14. I watched Martin run many great races throughout his time in Washville, but that was just the start of his great career. Martin went on to Syracuse, where he won the Big East Cross Country title in 2012. His Syracuse team won the 2015 NCAA Division I title. Martin won the Outdoor 10K title in 2014 and the Indoor 5K title in 2015. He broke the four minute mile mark as a junior, uh, running a 359.8, and I remember the ripple that that sent back to Orange County. And people talk about Martin all over the place breaking that four minute mile. By the time Martin was done with his college career, he was a three time NCAA All American. After college, Martin moved up in distance to the marathon, where he ran the Olympic trials, finishing sixth, narrowly missing the Olympic team. His best time of two hours, eight minutes, 59 seconds, has ranked him amongst the best runner marathoners in the world, and eighth fastest American of all time. As an alum, I am proud that you ran in the Washington single of blue and gold, but as a coach, I always wanted you to be in dark green. <laughs> It is my honor to introduce to you Hall of Famer, Martin Hare. I was definitely not prepared to give a little talk tonight, but I can definitely wing it. Um, yeah, I feel almost like, you know, thank you everyone for, for being here tonight. I feel almost, you know, I'm just here because I run fast, but I mean, some of these, these amazing coaches and teachers and just ins like inspirational folks here tonight are really the reason you know, people like me have run fast. Um, so I really want to say thank you to everyone in this room. Um, I really wanted to come here today and see Coach R. Jessup because you know he was someone um, that kind of when I started, I was you know I was I got into running pretty early. I ran like the Washington Hill Scholarship Run 5K back when that was a thing. It was kind of my first jump into a race when I was maybe in fifth or sixth grade. And I just kind of caught caught the itch um, and then I started running in middle school and was able to start running with the high school kids as a seventh grader that was, you know, was really fun for me and I still remember like showing up at summer practices and um, coach white was already the coach by then but coach Jessup was there almost more often than coach white was coach coach Jessup was there keeping an eye on us and he I mean his love for the sport and track and field was just infectious. Like he was writing up newsletters, like the Harrier newsletter. Um, he was like analyzing kind of everyone on the teams. He would print out like a piece of paper that showed like all our races, how we did from the year before, and kind of like how we did in our time trials that we would do over the summer to kind of show where we were at with training. Um, and, and just give us goals for like, you know, where he thought we should be for the upcoming season. And it's just like, Things like that, you know, looking back and realizing, like, having that sort of, having someone like that just kind of, like, giving you goals and showing you how exciting it can be, um, I think is, you know, really cultivated, kind of why I'm still here today. Still run, I ran a marathon last weekend, like, I'm still, like, just, I'm, I'm trapped for until my knees go down. So, um, you know, I just really, really, you know, very thankful for everyone in this room. Who I've had the chance to, to know. I know pretty much all the coaches from around Section 9 um, and to Coach Jessup. And then, of course, you know, I couldn't see him today, unfortunately, but Mrs. Jessup, uh, who I got to sit next to tonight, is, was my kindergarten teacher 25 years ago. So. That's where the world gets tough. Um, so, yeah, that, that's really it. Thank you all so much. Um, it's really cool seeing all these cool people and hearing all these awesome stories. So, um, wish everyone. Good rest of your night. It says, friends of Section 9 Track and Field Hall of Fame, Washingtonville Hall of Fame inductees, <laughs> Martin Hare, 2010 Cross Country, 1502, 2011, 3200, 9 minutes, 0.21. 
2011, 3,000, 8, 25, 64, 2011, 1,600, 4, 16, 25, 2016 and 2020 Olympic trials for the 10,000, 2020 Olympic trials marathon. Congratulations, Mark. It's both with joy and sadness that I'm giving the speech today. On one hand, I'm proud to have run in Washville and chased after the records that Joe set. And on the other hand, I know the coach has wanted to be standing here right now. Coach Jessup spoke about Chuck when his application came to the hall. And when he read it, he lit up just speaking about how great Chuck was. I have an email that Coach sent to Chuck and I about some of his accomplishments, accomplishments as we were trying to put some things together to say here today. So I'm going to read exactly word for word what Coach Jessup said in that email. I'm sure he would have done a much better job. Congrats on being selected to the Section 9 Hall of Fame. Here are a few stats that I have found. 1969 Class B Section 9 Cross Country Champion. 1970 Class B Section 9 Cross Country Champion. 1969 OCI AA Cross Country Champion. 1970 New York State Public High School Athletic Association State Cross Country Class B Individual Champion. 1969 and 1971 the OCIA IAA Mile and Two Mile Run titles. Won the Section 9 Mile Run title in 1971. 1972 won the USATF Junior National AAU Mile Run in 4 minutes 12.3 seconds in Denver, Colorado. <clears throat> and then ran against Russian team in Sacramento, California. Upon graduation, he held Washington school records in the 880 yard run. It used to be 880 yards to the younger ones back there. <laughs> Two, point, uh, two flat point eight in the mile run, a 418.5, and the two mile run, 948.5. Also set numerous cross country course records throughout Orange County during his career. The distance run battles between Dave Billings and Chuck in 1969 and 71 were some of the historic Section 9 races remembered by many. Now those were Coach Jessup's words. I want you all to know that despite Coach Jessup not feeling well um, as he was getting sick. He made sure that the clippings that he had saved for Chuck got placed in my hand. I'm not sure how they got to Washville, uh, Cornwall High School, excuse me, but I know the coach wanted them to be placed in your hand, so they're here for you today. It is my honor to introduce to all of you the newest Hall of Fame member, Chuck Forrest. Thank you all. I really appreciate being introduced as a uh, Hall of Famer. Chuck D. I would like to thank everybody who uh, voted for me, in particular, um, there were some folks who helped me out in navigating the process. Uh, Rich First, Brian Breeden, Frank Giannino, Mike White, and uh, with their assistance, uh, it was greatly appreciated. I got through pretty good, so thank you so much for that. Um, if Art were here, um, I would especially call out his unwavering support and friendship over the years. I believe he played an instrumental role in me coming through with this induction tonight, and I'm so thankful that he had the time uh, to, to be able to do that uh, before passing. So, as you probably hear, uh, most of this is about my induction, but it wouldn't it wouldn't be possible without Art Jessup. He's the one that really gave me the inspiration very, really, very early on in my career. I'm talking about the age of 13. So uh, it was with uh, one particular incident, and I can recount it here as well, uh, that I really uh, came to understand his program and the positive attitude that he conveyed to all of his athletes that allowed us to excel at what it is we wanted to do. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, obviously, being a, a great teacher, a motivator, a role model, and a true student of the sport, uh, he provided that positive force that I think all of his athletes enjoyed uh, and did well under. Bill Whitehead is here. Um, positive attitude environment, I think, were probably first, second, I think, uh, putting together good workouts, things that would improve your ability, uh, came secondary to that positive environment that he put forth. Uh, he was a great man, and I think that was the genius behind his program and folks who brought him to 
So it's been 55 years, and, and uh, you know, I fell in line with the program back then. Uh, it all started back in eighth grade, 1967. Um, he was the proctor of an exam, and uh, basically I was uh, the last one to leave that exam. I finished up and uh, handed my exam into Art. Art looked at me and said, uh, you have a couple minutes, I'd like to, to talk to you. And here it is, I, I thought we were done for the day. Well, one of us was done, somebody else wanted to make a sales pitch. Uh, and he did an effective job. So uh, it was with that that I uh, spent the summer uh, running. It was it, you know, his advice that I, I go out and, and do summer runs uh, and get ready for the season as it was coming up. We never mentioned anything about pain or training, or the training regimen. Um, he didn't have to, we found out soon enough in freshman year. Um, a lot of the workouts with the team were very helpful. And of course, time trials were very painful, so it took a while to get used to the regimen and some of the things that he was coaching. Um, so, at the age of 13, six foot and 120 pounds, I had to look at him and say, what, what is it that he saw in me that uh, allowed him to make a pitch for me to become a cross-country runner. I don't know, but I'm glad he did. It was a very important part of my life. So without going into all of the accolades that would come with you know, being first, second, third, whatever, uh, I put all of that aside. Uh, my kids came up and started running. Uh, they ran at an early age. They did the USATF track and field routine. Uh, they loved to travel. We had a great time as a family. It became a, uh, a family thing to be able to travel out in the country, uh, doing San Diego, Washington, uh, and other places. Uh, I put all of my money aside and look at them and what they did uh, as being important enough to be able to, to be able to give them what art had taught me. And, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, they pass that on to their kids, as you may know, in some of the comments. Um, they went on to do great things. They did uh, the Olympic trials uh, in a marathon for Matt, uh, 2012. His best was at 219, which was pretty good. It was his first time out. And then Craig, my younger son, ran uh, the Olympics trials in Eugene, Oregon twice, both in the steeplechase, 2012 and 2016. He placed sixth. In 2016, we didn't go on to the finals, but um, I think uh, their achievements eclipsed mine by far. So, with that, um, I'd like to say again, thank you very much for the honor of being here. You folks have been great. It's been 55 years for some of you, and it's been an eye opener, it really has. So, thank you all. Have a good day. New Washington Hall of Fame inductees 2023, Chuck Forey's 1969 and 1970, Section 9 Class B champion, 1970 cross country state champion, school records in 1971 in the 880, two, minute, uh, two minutes and point eight, one mile, four minutes, 18.5 seconds, two mile, nine minutes, 48.5. Congratulations, Chuck. Okay, can anybody hear me? That was my coach's voice. Um, anybody, first of all, Reggie Harris, what are you best in your run? Raise your hand, you can help me out here. 100. Okay. 100? 800. 100, 200, 400, 800. The reason I'm pointing that out to you is we consider that as a sprinter, long and short sprinter. So I will not be up here talking long. Okay, I'll snap it up to that. All right? With Reggie Harris, my association with him, I was at the time I was in the military, United States Army, at a place called Raffenville, Germany. My brother being here in Newburgh kept corresponding back, Reggie Harris, get Reggie Harris, Reggie Harris, Reggie. I'm like, come on, really seriously? Is he all that? Alright, so I go home to visit on what we call leave time. And I go to the meet and I watch O'Neill run in the meet. And I'm watching, I'm waiting, I'm like, okay, this kid better be good. I come all the way from Germany, it's my time, I'm only home for like 14 days, and I'm here at the track meet. So I go to the track meet, the 400 lines up, I ask my brother, who's Reggie Harris? He 
see that kid's right there, that kid right there. I'm like, okay. But I mean, to me, nothing stood out. He was just a regular looking runner. Gun goes off, pow. I wait, 100 meters go by, they're all together. 200 meter mark, you're all together, and all of a sudden this kid just, boom, he takes off. Like everybody else is just standing still. I looked at my brother, he gave me a high five, I give him a high five, and I couldn't say enough about him, because at this time I was coaching myself high school athletes in Germany. And at this, even to this day, he holds the 100 meter record. 30 years later, 100 meter record was just broke this year by Jenny Spain. But he held the 100 meter record, the 200 meter record, and the 400 meter record, which is unheard of over 30 years. And also, the state meet, and I never, in my 47 years of coaching, have been able to pull this one off. In the same state meet, same year, he won not only the 100 meter dash, but the 400 meter dash at the same statement. Now, like I said, you got three rounds of each. And normally, our, our coaches, what I'll say, at least for me, such as mine, winning that 100 is a hard one to do. Normally, that goes to the PSAL, the city team. But he took out the favorite in the 100 meters. And mind you, he only came, he came from O'Neill, James O'Neill, which is one of the smallest schools in section nine. So, as an athlete, I cannot say enough about them. I never formally got the chance to meet him because at the time I was a coach and I was just home on leave for a little bit. But really, my plane trip from Europe to here was worth it. And if I could do it all over again just to watch him run and even watch him run even more, I would have done it. So including, I'll say, in my 47 years of coaching, I consider Reggie Harris one of the best sprinters, boys on the boys' side, that I never had the chance to coach. So that's Reggie Harris. Thank you. Friends of Section 9 Track and Field Hall of Fame, James I. O'Neill, Hall of Fame inductees 2023, Reggie Harris, 1988 New York State Champion in the 100 meters at 10.50, and 1988 New York State Champion in 400 meters, 46.79. Congratulations to Reggie Harris. Be before I talk about the uh, 4x8 relay team and the distance medley relay team and the national champions, um, I do have one uh, Carol Perietti story to tell because uh, I was a I was a new coach and she was on the team. Don't worry, Carol, it's not that story. Um, but there were a lot of stories with Carol, a lot of stories, and this is one. It was in 1984, indoor state meet. Carol was qualified for the thousand meters, was warmed up, and just before they're ready to go out on the track, she realizes that she does not have on what they called at those point, at that point in time, her spanks. Chatter top, and not a bottle. <laughs> Carol runs up, it was at the carrier dome, and I hear this clink, 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 running down the, and here comes Carol, kind of, kind of in a tizzy, like, ah, oh, coach, I don't have my spanks, they're in the van, the van's out, the, uh, the race gonna, and unfortunately for one of our teammates, Richie Kostelnik, who happens to be walking by, I see her hand go out, and I see them disappear behind the stands, and then only Carol comes out <laughs> with, with Richie's shorts. <laughs> and, and I said, and she started, I said, Carol, where's Richie? She said, don't worry, he'll work it out. <laughs> she runs, that gets down onto the track, Right there, walking out onto the track, she gets onto the starting line, ends up placing fourth in 258.6, but she probably ran a thousand meters up two flights of steps before the race. It's good warm up. So, uh, that's a Carol story. And I uh, see I told you, I saved the other one. So um, there's a lot to be said about the the 2008. Warwick Girls State Champions 4x8 and um, National Champions 4x8 and National Champions in Record Setting Distance Medley. So I have a few things written. Um, so I'm going to try to try to read them because as I went through all of this in my mind, it was all clear. And now when I stand up here, um, there's all sorts of distractions. So I, I don't want to leave anything out. So let me let me start by by reading this, this is a tribute to the relay teams, 2008. Um, the Warwick 4x4, 4x8, and distance medley relay teams of 2008 were perhaps the best overall in Section 9 history, as between five girls they earned eight gold, 
five silver medals at the state meet and an incredible eight gold medals and set a national record in a distance medley uh, at the Nike Outdoor National Track and Field Championships. These girls were uh, included the seniors Tori Pennings, uh, Claire Pettit, uh, they were seniors, junior Kristen Jados, who could not make it here today, sophomore Lillian Griebesland, who's currently in uh, Norway, um, and a freshman, Jacqueline Casal. So on Friday, June the 13th, it's ominous in its own respect, uh, Griebesland, Jados, and Pettit teamed with, with uh, Shanae Bentley to play second in Division One, 4x4 running what was then a school record of, of 354.56. The next day, the same team ended up in the meet of, of champions and also placing second uh, to Boys and Girls High School and running 352.70. And that was another school record. Then on the 14th, Pennings placed second to national champion Emily Lapiri, Lapiri in a PR of, of 433.22 for 1,500 meters. Just a little while later, the seniors, plus Jattles, and with freshman Jacqueline Casal, teamed to win the state championship, four by eight in 856.71. Casal, freshman at Thun, led off in 219.1. Pennings, on one hour rest, from the 1500 ran to 14.5. Pettit broke the race wide open with a 211.5 leg, and Griebesland cruised to a victory in 211.3. These are incredible time fries I never saw. I, th I thought there was something wrong with my watch, um, but no, that's what they ran. Then that 4x4, um, which was less than an hour later, showed that those girls w were more than, more than fit. They had desire, they had focus, they wanted, they wanted to perform for each other, and there was nothing that was gonna stand in their way. And so that's what they did a week later. A week later, um, Pennings, Jados, Pettit, and Griebesland teamed up in the four by eight and distance medley at the National Outdoor, at the Nike National, Outdoor Nationals, here we go. The 4x8 saw Jados lead off in 218.9 to put the team in the mix. Pennings went hard and jumped into the lead with a 213.7 leg, and Pennant never looked back and ran away in 211.1. And Grievous Land anchored again in 211.3, and that team ran 855.74 to win the national championship. But it was the next day when the DMR was ready to hit the track, and they had a little bit of a challenge because um, Lillian had her half mile spikes, but she didn't have her milers, and there's no way she could run in those 800 spikes because she has to run the miler spikes. O only, only a really focused, accomplished track runner would get that, but I was like, well, just, just where the, oh no, no, so chaperone, and Dad, Pete Griebesland, who's sitting back there, remembers this story. There's only some half truths here. It's mostly the truth. so. He says, "Don't worry, Coach. We got this covered." He canvasses all of North Carolina, and he plays within two and a half hours, and finds out that there are no spikes of that brand available anywhere in North Carolina. And so now these girls which had decided they were gonna win another national championship. And I told them if they set a national record, just to add a little bit to the pot, I would shave my mustache. Um, <laughs> they figured this out. It turns out that Hennings, who was the lead off, had the exact same size and exact same spikes that Lillian wanted to run in. So, practiced the night before. Pennings ran one lap around a big field, coming in a little bit, tired, hard, breathing hard, and yeah, shoes off, shoes off, shoes off, get ready, shoes on, shoes And they did the switch. We figured they needed two minutes and eight seconds to do it, and they accomplished it just under two minutes. I said, okay, I think we're good. We just gotta remember, and Tori says, 
but I'm going to run as hard as I can. What if I just don't think? What if I just forget? <laughs> Another chaperone, John Payne, who had a bullhorn for a voice. So this, this is small potatoes compared to what Payne could do. He said, don't worry, I'll just go over by the finish line, and if she spends more than 10 seconds, I'll just yell to her, Tori Spikes! I, I don't know if he ever did that. I, I re-watched the race, and I see Tori finishing, and she's like this, standing around like this, like, oh, I want Spikes. But somehow, they got it done in a minute and 52 seconds. Around the corner comes Claire Pettit. Lillian's there at the starting line. Like, come on, come on, come on. And off they go. So here's what, here's what Pennings did. She led off, um, and Saratoga tried to run away. Tried to run away early, which is what they, what they do. They intimidate by running away early, and everybody says, oh my God, it's Saratoga, we're never gonna catch it. But Pennings, on that, third, on that third lap, focused, you can see in the video, you can see her eyes staring at the back of Brianna Bellum, who was the Saratoga girl. And she's getting closer and closer and closer. And at the handoff, she's like from me to him behind Saratoga. Ran 333.1 for three quarters. It's a hard race to run, um, and that's an outstanding time. The announcers are getting excited because in the next leg, Junior Christian Jados, who has literally fire in her eyes, looks at the Saratoga runner, goes after her, catches her on the first curve, and, and just runs away. And at the handoff, we got, a, we got a pretty good lead. From here to the section nine sign on Saratoga. Claire Pettit gets the baton. Oh, by the way, Jados ran 56.6 .6 on a relay leg and put several seconds in there. Then, Pettit gets the baton. And she's being chased. Pettit had run to 11.1 .1 the night before, and she's being chased down by a Saratoga girl who comes up on her. But, no. Claire had an extra, an extra gear in the last 100 meters and opens up some more daylight. And Lillian's like this, perfect handoff in the zone, and off she goes. And then the, a girl named Hannah Davidson from Saratoga closes up, closes in, and tries to do what the Saratoga does. Comes right up on her shoulder and tries to go goodbye, but no, no, Lillian wasn't having that. She got on her shoulder, and that's as close as she could not get the lead. The announcer said, oh, these, these two teams, they might run, they, they might run one of the top five teams in the day. They're gonna go under 1140. They're running fast. On the next lap, here comes Davidson again. Coming up on to Griebstein, tries to pass. Lily wouldn't let, it, wouldn't let it happen. She got next to her, and she had to drop back. Now, what we teach is that in a mile or two mile, you can make three moves. You can do that three times, but you can't do it a fourth time. Three, your body won't let you. And we prepped. Lillian, Hannah's gonna try to pass, that's what they do. She's gonna try to pass you. Um, but on the third time, when she presses you, let her go by and tuck in right behind her because that would be her third move. But you've only made two. She stayed behind her on the last lap, last curve. She said, I know it's my time to go. I just stepped outside and took off. And she literally just ran away and there was nothing that Davidson could do because she already used her three moves. And at the finish, Pennant was 211.3. Here comes Grievous Land down the finish, and they're, they're screaming about, oh, this could be a national record. And it was. They ran 1131.81. At that time, it was a national record. And the official time for Lillian 
for her anchor was 450.0. But the officials did not have the advantage of this finger or this watch. <laughs> because these two teamed up and timed Lillian in 449.79. And that's what it says on the paper that when you read that, that's what it says. Okay? Um, and if you, if you ever want to see something that is really inspirational, that speaks to the kind of athletes, the kind of people that these girls are, you should, you should Google the uh, Nike Outdoor National 2008 Distance Medley Relay, and you will see it, and you will see. I mean, I saw it this morning, and I jumped out of my chair. This is 15 years ago, but I, but I felt it. Those girls ran for each other, and whatever I said, they would do. If I said, run with one hand on top of your head, they'd be running like this. Whatever I, so as a coach, you realize, whoa, these kids will do whatever I tell them, so it better be good. And um, for me, it was a challenge, and I thank you all for that, because you made me a better coach. I had to really search and realize it. What, whatever I tell them to do, that's what they're going to do, and it better be right. And um, luckily for, for us, that turned out that turned out to, to be what we refer to as, as magic, something nobody thought that we could ever do. But if you don't if you don't go after, if you don't try, if you don't believe, and if you don't work together with other people, yeah, it'll never happen. But if you do believe. And if you put your heart and soul, like they did, into something, then yeah, magic happens. And, and I'm, I am so proud and grateful that I happened to be the coach on that day. So I want to, I want to uh, bring these girls up. Rico wants to uh, finish reading the plaque. Yeah. <laughs> Girls, you're awesome in the building. We love you. Thanks for everything. Uh, it's my great privilege to read these names in top of Carol Perry Eddie, uh, 1983 New York State XC champion. This plaque will also be in the hallway and it will state Tori Pennings, Kristen Janos, Claire Pettit, Lillian Griebeslin, and Jackie Jacqueline Cassell. 2008 Endure New York State 4 by 800 meter champions with a 916.95. Distant Met DMR National Champions 1144.44. It doesn't say it on our plaque, coach. They were indoors. Indoors. 4 by 800, uh, second place, 906.33. Indoors? Yes, 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 yes. Indoors. Two way outdoor New York State four way 800 champions 856.71. National champions four way 800 855.74. National champions and record DMR 1131.81. Congratulations, ladies. I would be remiss if I didn't share one brief Judy Berry story with you. She played the faculty basketball game at Warwick at 70 plus years old. Judy Berry, love her. Just very briefly, we didn't prepare much, but you can see just from that story right, right there, um, the real reason we had so much success over those years was coach first. When you had somebody telling you stories like that every day at practice and knowing the stats of every person on the team, top five for every, uh, every event, for every season you could get on the list. Um, and someone who believed in you like that, I just felt like I was back at practice right now. Like, I'm like all pumped up, I have like shivers, like, you know, I feel like I'm about to race. Um, it, it's all because of Coach First. Um, and you know, we're, we're three here, we're missing a few of our legs, and you know, we're missing actually a few more girls behind us, girls ahead of us. We were part of the purple wave that lasted, um, that's still going on, but it, it's an honor to be up here, to be representing all of them, and thank you, Coach First, for everything you've done for all of us, for all of us. Thank you. 
Well, folks, our inductees represented the late 1960s, the 1970s, the 2000s, up until present. So let's give them all a great round of applause. When I was a small lad about this high, I first heard of Art Jessup's name when he was the guard on the undefeated Monroe Woodbury 1960 basketball team. He ran the show. Well, maybe I was a little taller than that, I'm not sure. So you wanted to hear a couple stories, so I'll just tell you one, or maybe a part of another, as his wife reminded me when she got here tonight. I drove Mark Jessup home one night from one of these banquets, not this in particular, but another banquet. And as Judy so eloquently reminded me, he ruined their entire lawn and trying to get out of their place, because I did not know. Now the reason was, oh no, we have children here, never mind. <laughs> but I'd just like to say one thing, this is a quote that has been given to me, applies to the Washingtonville community, and it goes something like this, a great coach. It's hard to find. A great coach is difficult to keep. And a great coach is impossible to forget. And we will never, never forget our judgment. That was sort of uh, an introduction by Lou to uh, Judy. And uh, we haven't mentioned Judy enough today. Judy, could you come up and join us? Judy, uh, when we started the Hall of Fame awards, uh, would come every award ceremony, and she would work that uh, table and uh, take in the money and keep track of uh, what tables people were sitting in. And the other thing about Judy is she always brings her cookies. If you, have, if you ever work with uh, her in any capacity, you're the beneficiary of the greatest uh, uh, chef. What do what they call those? Cook, cookie chef? Baker. 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 Baker's. <laughs> that there is. And Judy, uh, we want to uh, recognize you as being a support for art. Like the coaches have mentioned, you can't do it alone. It takes the support of a loving family and a loving wife. And uh, you and Todd were certainly that for her. Uh, and for that reason, for all that Art has given to the track and field community in Section 9, we have an annual scholarship award, and we decided that it was fitting to name that annual scholarship award after Art. So from here on in, the winner of uh, our scholarship, on a, it's a $1,000 scholarship right now, will be the winner of the Art Chestnut Memorial Scholarship. All right, our first annual Art Chestnut Scholarship winner, he's not with us today, he's off from college, Mr. Jose Aurelio Seely from Marvel. Spring of 2022, this is from its coach. Jose was fourth on the depth chart in the throws in Marlboro. He continued to work throughout the year. Jose not only was the first person to practice, he was the last person to leave. He is the most committed thrower or track athlete on the team. During the outdoor season, he threw 49-2 in a shot. 47-5 in the discus, both of which were the best of any Marlboro thrower in over a decade. And both earned him a trip to the state meet. He also threw 181-5 in the hammer, which earned him, which was a, a school record. He qualified for outdoor nationals for New Balance. Jose has never failed to put his nose down and grind through any adversity that he's seen, both in and out in the classroom, on the track and field, or at home. Consistently shows up for practice, Give up his free period to come out and throw. He's overcome a lot of difficulty in the situation with his legal guardians and his grandfather. His father, his grandfather passed away, leaving him his grandmother and his uncle. Jose 
was very private regarding his home life, but never let it show on the track or in the classroom. He's up at Binghamton where he's trying to walk on as a hammer thrower. He greatly appreciates the scholarship and looks forward to getting a chance to meet everybody here. So one more round of applause for Sir Jose. Really